Many doubted we'd ever see it. But here it is. You just don't know when to give up, do you? I can do this all day. The inbound pass comes into Jordan. Here's Michael at the foul line. A shot on Elo. Guys! The Bulls win! They win it! Ladies and gentlemen, the winner by Nick. Good start for Nebraska. Old stumbles. Regains his footing and now he's trailing. He has some work to do. Nebraska's meantime pressing for the lead. The same ball coming up. Ball looking over his shoulder. And he gets there in time. I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. And I am back. The return to glory. Red five, I'm going in. Welcome back to part three of Comebacks, a series we started on uh, Easter weekend. Now, let me, let me set up where we're going this weekend with a story. Uh, it was the grand opening of a brand new fitness center, a, a brand new health club, and they were holding a contest, and the winner of the contest got a lifetime membership, free, absolutely lifetime membership to this health club, and here was the contest. The owner of the club was this bodybuilder, a, a huge bodybuilder. I mean, you, you've, the kind that have muscles on their muscles. Have you seen those guys? It's like they got muscles on their neck. You know, the, well, we don't have muscles. They have muscles. This guy had muscles. And so here was a contest he set up. He was going to squeeze an orange. And anyone who would squeeze it after he did and could get one more drop of juice, just one, won a lifetime membership. And so he squeezed this orange, this guy, it was bone dry. There was like nothing left, but people lined up anyway. And, 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 and other bodybuilders, and then there were, were construction workers, and there were college athletes and high school athletes and middle school athletes, and there were Zumba people. Anyway, all kinds of people lined up. And, and they, they got up, but no one could get any more juice out of that orange because this guy, he squeezed it dry. But there was one more person, one more person wanted to try. And, and it was kind of this, to be honest, kind of skinny, scrawny looking guy. And when he stepped up on the platform, people kind of, they kind of laughed like, what chance does this guy have? And, and, but moments later, they were blown away because this kind of wimpy looking guy squeezed six more drops dropped into a glass. They, they, the owner was blown away. He said, you win. You win a lifetime membership, but I got to ask you, what do you do for a living? He goes, oh, I work for the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry. That's the only, <laughs> that's the, I'm sorry. That is the only tax collector joke I have. All right, that, that's it. Don't write me. I use that to set up a story in the Bible about a tax collector for the Roman IRS. It's in the Bible. And his story is told in Luke, Luke chapter 19. Let's pick it up. It's in your notes, on your Bibles, on the screens. You can't miss it. Verse 1. And Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus, who was the chief tax, what? Collector in the region. Let me pause here for just a moment. The tax collectors, there were three basic regions in Israel. Caesarea, which is by the sea, all the ships that came in, they taxed you as soon as you landed. There was a tax center in Jericho. People would come up from Egypt and, and in that area. And there was a tax center in Jerusalem. Three major tax regions. 
This particular tax collector named Zacchaeus was the chief, the big dog tax collector for one of the three biggest regions for the Jericho region. Pick it up. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too, what? Short to see you over the crowd. So he what? I want you to circle the word ran in your notes and your body. So he ran ahead and what? Climb. Okay, these are very important words we will come back to. But he ran and he climbs a sycamore fig tree beside the road. For Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down, took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation or wholeness has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are, what? Lost. Lost. Now, first time I ever remember hearing about Zacchaeus, we actually call him Zacchaeus. So whichever way you say it, I don't think he cares. As long as you say his name, he's fine. Just say my name. So anyway, so as long as you say his name. So if we call him Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus, I first heard of him when I was in children's church. As just a little boy. Because we sang a song about him. Anybody remember that song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, right? And, and, and so, some of you know the song, others of you are, are totally lost. <laughs> he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, and as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in that tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house. Yeah, you, you say it today, I learned it, for I'm going to your house for tea. I learned the British version, okay? <laughs> Like, see, tea rhymes with tree. Going to your house today doesn't rhyme with anything. But, but that's the VeggieTales version. So VeggieTales says, I'm going to your house today, I'm going to your house today. But, but my, my version was, I'm going to your house for tea. But the gist was, we learn that song as children. And some of us in this place, and some of you apparently didn't learn that song, but those of us who did, that's often the last time we even thought about Zacchaeus. It's the last time we remember even hearing about him, was in a song as a child. And I remember loving the song because when you're a kid, you like other little people. So he was kind of short and so we kind of related. But there's so much more to his story than the children's song. The children's song catches the gist of his story. But I want you to take a few moments with me today and I want us to walk back through his story with adult eyes, with grown-up eyes. Because in his story, you'll discover something amazing, that, that the story of Zacchaeus is an amazing comeback story. It is the comeback story of an outsider. Now, Zacchaeus was, in many ways, kind of like the ultimate outsider. He was an outsider on multiple levels. He was an outsider socially. He was an outsider spiritually. And the reason he was an outsider in so many ways was what we already read, because he was a tax collector, not just a tax collector, a tax collector for Rome. Now, a Jewish person who collected taxes for Rome, Rome was the enemy, Rome was the occupier, and they were considered a traitor to their people. You were a traitor if you, if you got money from me for our enemy, and, and, and not only that, and they were hated and despised, he was a tax collector because he was corrupt. See, you, you didn't become a tax collector for Rome unless you gave the biggest bribe. Rome was after the bottom line of money. Whoever paid the most money, you bought that, that franchise of being a tax collector because it was a business. And here was the business of tax collecting. The business was Rome wanted their cut, and anything above their cut you could get was your cut. So you could tax on top of it. You had a handling charge. You had a service fee. And so you could put as much on top of the tax as you wanted. And that's why they got rich. And, and I was reading and digging, and it was, I found it so interesting, was these tax collectors for Rome were given power by Rome, because Rome was like the, 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 the enforcer, and they could tax anything they could, they could possibly tax, and they did. 
They taxed income. They taxed oil. They taxed crops. They taxed produce. They taxed, they taxed the wagons that you carried your stuff in. They would tax the animals that pulled your wagon. They would tax anything and everything they could. Welcome to Jericho, California. <laughs> Sorry. They taxed it all. Anything that you could possibly tax, you tax. And so that's what Zacchaeus did. That's who Zacchaeus was. Tax collectors were known for being dishonest. They were known for being corrupt. They were known for being a tool and an instrument of Rome. And they were known for being isolated. See, the only people that wanted to hang out with a tax collector were other tax collectors. And even tax collectors, because they were competing with each other, weren't all that close. And so the tax collector life was a very separated life, an outsider life. They weren't even allowed. There were, there were very devout Jews who would not allow themselves to touch a tax collector. Remember, Jesus tells a story about a very religious man, and he's worshiping, and he sees a tax collector, and he says, oh, God, I thank you that I'm not like him. They would pray that out loud. Thank you, God, I'm not a tax collector. I may be bad, but I'm not as bad as him. Okay, so, so that's the world, the outsider world of a tax collector. But my opinion, and I believe this strongly, was that Zacchaeus was an outsider even before he became a tax collector. In fact, maybe he became a tax collector because he was already an outsider. And here's why I say that, because Luke, who writes this, and he's the only one who includes this story in, in, of the Gospels, Luke writes this, and Luke is a doctor, if you'll recall. He writes the book of Luke, he writes the book of Acts, and he often uses medical terms. In the Greek language, he uses terms very specific because he was a, a physician, and, and he describes, I had you say it out loud, he describes Zacchaeus as short, as being too short to see over the crowd. See, Jesus came to town and, and masses of people were around. They wanted to see him and Zacchaeus wanted to see him, but he was too short to see. Now, the word that Luke gives us for short doesn't just mean small or just short in stature. It's, a, it's kind of a, an interesting Greek word and it really goes beyond that. It, it describes someone who never really grew up into an adult. It describes a little person. Zacchaeus is known in Jericho for being the smallest man in the entire region. It wasn't just that he was short, he was a little person and he was, he was different looking. Now to this day, but especially in that day, to be different looking was to be on the outside. When you're different looking, people stare at you. When you're different looking, People don't invite you to events and parties and gatherings. When you're different looking, especially in biblical times, it was even a level worse than our time in that they often equated physical deformities, physical differences as judgment from God. If you were blind, you did something wrong. If, if you were lame, you did something wrong. If you were, if you were, if you had never grown up, if you were a little person, it's because God had judged you. And so he lives his life as a little boy who never grows up as an outsider. And, and all the guys in the room understand this. I mean, you, you can be a little female and, 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 and short, but, but when you're a little male, it's like see, our whole world is like king of the hill. It's, it's not about short. It's about pushing people off. And when you're short and male, when you're little and male, when you're an adult but you don't look like an adult, you're on the outside. But Zacchaeus, as small as he was physically, had a big ambition. He was driven. How do I know that? You don't become the chief tax collector. You don't become the big dog. Rome doesn't care how tall you are. Rome doesn't care how you look. Rome just cares, do we get our money? And if you can get our money, we'll take you. We don't care who you are. We just want the bottom line. And so he becomes this, this big dog tax collector because people were going to look up to him one way or the other. They might look, not look up to him physically, but they were going to look up to him. They were going to owe him. They were going to fear him. They were going to respect him. Because how many know that when you have money, you get respect? Even though you don't just, Anybody here like musicals other than Pastor Jason? Anybody here like, like, okay, like we know Jay, like Fiddler on the Roof? Anybody remember Fiddler on the Roof? If I were a rich man. Boo -boo. Anyway, so this, this rich man song, If I Were a Rich Man. And one of the lines in this song, and I, and I, I looked it up to make sure I got it right. 
One of the lines simply said this, if I were a rich man, it won't make one bit of difference if I answer right or wrong. When you're rich, they think you really know. When you got money, people listen to you. They wouldn't listen to you if you were poor, but if you got money, they'll listen to you. And that's, I believe, what drove, in part, Zacchaeus to become this chief tax collector because he had been on the outside his entire life. And if I'm gonna be on the outside, at least I'm gonna get some level of status and respect and power, and people are gonna listen to me because I take taxes for Rome. Now, let, let, let's connect his story with ours just for a moment, because some of you are going, okay, that's interesting, but that's, that's not my world. Every one of us have imperfections, have flaws, have experiences, have been treated in ways that make us feel like an outsider. I think you'd be shocked at how many very successful people still feel like they're on the outside. People you would think have, have the world by the tail still feel like they're on the outside looking in. You'd be surprised how many people that you think outwardly are, are absolutely perfect and they will tell you exactly where their flaws are because that's the only place their eye goes. When they look at themselves, they see their flaws, they see their mistakes. And there are many of us in this room and, 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 and some of you have had times in the past in your life in which you have felt so much like an outsider. In fact, I'm very aware some of you today in this place may feel like an outsider in here. I felt like an outsider. I went to a Catholic church. I was part of a Catholic funeral. I've been part of Catholic weddings. And when I, I'm not, I was not raised Catholic. And when I go to a Catholic church, I am an outsider. What I mean is I'm lost. They, they, they will kneel and it's like, where do you, where, who told you to do that? They just all kneel. They do stuff like it's not in the program. I don't see it anywhere. There's no signs that flash. And it's like, I'm, I'm all of a sudden, I'm, I'm one step behind everybody. And then I realize, you know, that must be like people who come to our church. And it's like, what do I do next? And so I, I know what that's like. Everybody's been an outsider at some time. And some of you feel like an outsider right now. And not just in church, at school, at work, in relationships. And the thing about being an outsider is, out, being an outsider distances us, not only from others, but it, 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 it distances us from what we were called and created to be. There is a pain to being an outsider. There is a, there is a, there's a woundedness to being an outsider that we were never meant to experience or know. And so I believe that God's will is that you and I experience a comeback from being on the outside. And that's where the story of Zacchaeus comes in. Because the worst thing in Zacchaeus' life, being an outsider, was not the last thing in Zacchaeus' life, being an outsider because of Jesus. And the worst thing in our life is not the last thing in our life because Jesus came back, so can we. That's the essence of this series. And the story of Zacchaeus is so much more than a children's song in children's church or veggie tales. It's really the story of a comeback. And the same reasons that Zacchaeus could come back are the same reasons we can come back. And I want you to write them down for just the next, next few moments. There are three words. There are three, there are three lessons for us, comeback lessons from Zacchaeus' story. And, and here's the first one in your notes. The reason Zacchaeus came back and we can come back is this. Jesus looks for outsiders. What I want you to write is looks. It wasn't by coincidence or chance that Jesus walked through Jericho on that day. He's on his way to Jerusalem. Now, there are many ways to get to Jerusalem, and going through Jericho was not the safest. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan, the man who got beaten up. It was on that road from Jericho to Jerusalem. That was known as a very dangerous route. And that was not the only route, but Jesus is going that way. And I believe he's going that way because he has an appointment with Zacchaeus. John tells us one time Jesus goes through Samaria. Again, Jewish people did not go through Samaria. They went around Samaria. But Jesus goes through Samaria because he says, I have to. He had an appointment with a woman by a well. A woman that had been married multiple times. And you know the story. He sits by the well. The disciples go into town because he's got an appointment with this woman. And not only does she come to discover, she finds out he's the Messiah the whole town comes back and discovers he's, it was an amazing time, but it's because Jesus was looking for her. Jesus says, we just read it in the story, Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I 
must go to your house. So this, this is a, a divine appointment that Jesus has. He is looking for this man, Zacchaeus. He knows what town he lives in. He knows what tree he's climbed. He knows the limb he has gone out on. And I want to talk about that just for a moment. Let's just talk about not only the fact that Jesus knew where he was, he knew why he was where he was. And I want you to write a couple of things down about Zacchaeus and about us, and it's this. Like Zacchaeus, we often run wherever we run. Everybody runs somewhere, and we climb whatever we climb. Everybody climbs some ladder. Everybody climbs something. We run where we run. We climb what we climb because I want you to write down two words, hunger pains. We run and we climb because of hunger pains. I believe that Zacchaeus ran and climbed that tree not simply because he was curious. In fact, curiosity would not make him do these two things. He ran and he climbed. And the reason I say that is because, is because rich people did not run. And he was very wealthy. We already established that. You know the story of the prodigal son and when the father runs to his son and it was shocking because rich men, patriarchs did not run and, and Zacchaeus as a rich man would not run unless it was desperate. So there's, there's, there's something desperate in his running. Adults did not climb trees. Now as a kid's thing, like, like just yesterday, my wife and I, like I take my wife out to really nice, so, so we go to Lolita. So we go to, to <laughs> I'm a big spender. We go to Lolita's, we go to in and out So anyway, so, so we go to Lolita's, and, and I'm standing in line, and I'm watching. I just told Jewel this yesterday, so she gets a seat, and I'm in line getting the food. And I see this probably, I don't know, probably a seven, eight-year-old girl, and, and, and she goes up to the counter, and she's just bouncing. She's just bouncing. She's bouncing and jumping, and, and I sit down, and I go, do you know what? We don't do that anymore. <laughs> Kids don't just walk. They, they jump, and they dance. It's like, I don't want to waste that much energy doing that. Kids climb trees. This is, adults don't climb trees. So, so, so I ask you to circle the word run and climb because those are not normal activities of adults or rich people. He did them because he was desperate. He did them because he was hungry. But he didn't know what for. Have you ever been there? Have you ever, have you ever been hungry but you're not sure what? God, all right. How many of you are here? Just check it. Just, just. Like. So many of these things happened to me just, just last, last Sunday night, okay, after the weekend, after the ministry, and it's Sunday night, and, and it's like, how many think there ought to be a law, no food commercials after like <laughs> noon, okay? <laughs> so it's like, they, they all, it's just nothing but food commercials, and all of a sudden you, get, you find yourself getting hungry. And so I go to the refrigerator, and it's like, nothing, and I went to the, to the pantry, like, nothing. Have you ever done that? And you just, you just stand there, like, looking there. <laughs> Like, what am I here after? And then I found something. True story. I found something. It's something I would normally not eat. But when you're, when you're, when you're, so I pull it out and it was past the expiration date. Have you ever done that? <laughs> and then I asked my wife, do you think this is okay? She's like, eh. So I thought, I'm going to cook it. I'll put it, I'll put it in, the, in the oven and I'll burn off whatever's bad. <laughs> True story. So I put it in the oven, but I forgot, and I had the broiler on instead of the oven, and all of a sudden, pff, smelling. Like, okay, so first of all, I didn't know that I wanted it, then I burned it. And I really couldn't eat it, so I threw it away. And I went to bed still hungry. Because sometimes you don't know what you want. And sometimes you get all kinds of things, you think that's it. And, and so I think Zacchaeus, he got money, and that wasn't it. He got power, that wasn't it. He got status, that wasn't it. The reason he ran, the reason he climbed was he was hungry. But he wasn't sure what he was hungry for. Hunger pains are not always a bad thing. In fact, sometimes our hunger pains can be a very good thing. In fact, Jesus says this, Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who, what? Hunger and thirst for Righteousness. Now, I added in your notes, right standing, right relationship. That's what righteousness means. It means to stand right with God, to be right with God, be right with God and others, for they will be what? Filled. Sometimes I believe God actually triggers our hunger pains because he knows the things we're running after and the 
trees and ladders we're climbing will not do it for us. Paul says, for we are complete in Christ. And so sometimes I believe God will trigger our hungers as a path toward fullness. And let me put it like this. How many think the prodigal son would have ever gone home had he not run out of money and become desperately hungry? I don't think so. He took all of his money, his dad's wealth, and he went to Vegas. I mean, well, he went to the others. He went to where what happens there stays there until he ran out of money. Then he ran out of friends. Then he ran out of food. And then he found himself so desperately hungry that what he was feeding the pigs, he wanted to eat. And then he said, you know what? It doesn't get any worse than this. So he turns his heart toward home and discovers not only home, but his father's heart in ways he had never known before. And my opinion is God uses hunger pains to trigger. Do you think Zacchaeus would have ever climbed a tree or run or, or wanted to see Jesus if he was satisfied with his money? If he was satisfied with everything he had, he never would have run. He would have, he wouldn't have been that interested because why do I need to see this person because I've got it all, but he didn't. Pay attention to your hunger pains because they're telling you that what you've found so far isn't it. Let me give you a second, a second truth to write. Like Zacchaeus, we sometimes run where we run and climb what we climb because we're looking for a hiding place. Why don't you write the words hiding place? I believe Zacchaeus wanted to go to that tree, not just because he wanted a place from which he could see, but he wanted a place in which he could hide. I believe he was trying to hide, first of all, from the crowds. I believe this strongly. We already read, and I just don't have time to walk you back through every detail. We already read that the crowds were ticked off that Jesus was going to his house, and they grumbled and said, he's a notorious sinner. People did not like tax collectors. But I'll tell, you, I'll tell you another way, you know the crowd doesn't like him. Tax collectors were not comfortable in crowds. Now normally, okay, like I'm a little over average height and when I go to parades, I usually have no problem seeing. If a short person says, you mind if I stand here? It's like, I can still see over you, no problem, go right here. He was the shortest man in town, but nobody wanted to let him in the front. They could see over him, but they were not about to because nobody was gonna give Zacchaeus a place. He wasn't that welcomed or wanted in crowds. And so it was better to kind of be away from the crowd, but he still wanted to see. I think he was not only hiding from the crowds, I think he was hiding from Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus, but he wasn't sure he wanted Jesus to see him. <laughs> Have you ever been there? He wanted to see him, but, but he, wasn't so, see, he, he wasn't so sure he want, if Jesus really was the Messiah, there was a good chance he would be as ticked off with tax collectors as people were. So he found a sycamore tree. I got a picture. I want to show you. Here's a picture of a sycamore tree. And this is actually in Jericho. And the reason I want to show this to you was the sycamore tree was a perfect tree. Because see how low, the, this, there's a road going right by this tree. I'm not saying this is not the tree, but this is just like this in Jericho by a road. See how low those branches are? Even little people can get up those trees. They're not only easy to climb, but look at all the leaves. There's so many leaves. It is great camouflage. You can go right out on one of those limbs and nobody knows you're there. So it was perfect. He goes up in a tree because he wants to hide. He felt safe. Now let me tell you something. Listen very carefully. Hiding places may seem like safe places, but they are not. Hiding places are missing out places. Because we were created to know and be known, to love and be loved, and that never happens in hiding places. Any of you, when you were a kid, play hide and seek? Okay, how many of you were kids? Let me see your hands. Let's, let's, you you got to work with me here. I play hide and seek. Hide and seek is an isolating game. Because if you found a good spot to hide and someone else came with you, what did you say? Get out of here, it's my spot right? Because you didn't want a little kid in your spot because they would laugh and give you up, right? So you, you, you had to hide alone. Hide and seek is a, a hiding alone game. There's no community in hide. You don't hide in clubs. You hide by yourself. Mm. 
And Jesus knows that hide and seek is not just a children's game, it's a losing game. Because when you hide, you miss out. And he was trying to hide. And you and I try to hide in many ways. And when we hide, we miss. We miss what God has, which is why Jesus said, I'm it. And he said, I came to seek and save. I'm it. I came to find hiders. So the first reason that Zacchaeus was able to come back from being an outsider is because Jesus looks for outsiders. They look for him, he looks for us. Now here's the second, in your notes. The second comeback factor for Zacchaeus and us is this. Jesus knows and loves outsiders. I want you to write two words down. I want you to write the word knows and loves. What happens next in Zacchaeus' story always makes me smile. It just does. If you don't read scripture and smile, there's parts of scripture that are funny. And if you don't get it, it's just, it's your, it's your humor. So there's something funny here. Zacchaeus anticipates where Jesus is going. There's a road that goes through and there's a sycamore tree by the road. And so he runs ahead of the crowd. He climbs up the tree. He's safe. He can see. He's camouflaged. Here comes Jesus. This is perfect. Exactly what I planned. I can hear him. And then Jesus walks right to the tree he's in. And he looks up. Oh. Now the whole crowd, they got no idea Zacchaeus is in this tree. They're watching Jesus. And when Jesus looks up, what does the crowd do? They look up. What are you looking at? Who's up there? Okay, like the oak. Now, when you're in a tree, now, now you can't. What was safe is no longer safe. And Jesus calls his name. Zacchaeus. He now knows where he is. He knows his name. And says, hustle down from the tree. I must be a guest at your house today. I'm inviting myself over to your place. So I ask you to write no's and I ask you to write love's because listen carefully, Jesus not only knew where he was, Jesus knew who he was, he knew his name. That had to blow Zacchaeus away. He knows my name. He not only knew his name, he knew what he had done. He knew what he'd done to others. He knew everything about him, which is one of the reasons he was hiding. There's a book I read years ago. I just pulled it out this week. It's it's an old book, but it's still, it's a very insightful book written by Written again by Dr. John Powell, it's simply titled, Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? And the gist of his book is simply that you and I are often afraid to reveal the real us because we have a fear that if you really knew the real me, you wouldn't like me. You wouldn't love me. You would reject me. Ever heard that phrase, put your best foot forward? Uh, How have you ever, like on dates, like, like, you got to go on several dates because dating is meant to conceal and not reveal. <laughs> and then later you go, like, this is not the person I went out with the first time. Well, no, that wasn't me. That was the, that was the me to hook you. <laughs> so we often hide because if we were really ourselves, some, let's, let's get real. Come on, let's, let's go deep for a moment. Some of us don't like to reveal ourselves because we don't really like ourselves. And we know things about us that we think if you knew about us, you would not want to be with me. Anthony Campolo is a great speaker, and he makes this statement. He says, if you knew everything about me, you would not want me to speak to you. But if I knew everything about you, I wouldn't talk to you either. So it's like that's how (laughs) we all have that kind of fear. But I want to tell you something. Listen very, very carefully. Listen, please listen. Nobody knows you and me better than Jesus He knows us better than we know ourselves, and nobody loves us more. He knows stuff about you that you haven't even admitted about you. He knows stuff about me that I don't even know about me, but nobody loves me more than he does. Because God's love is not performance-based. God's love is grace-based. We shared communion today. Communion is the grace of God. A grace is an un unmerited gift, an unearnable gift. If you paid for it, it wouldn't be a gift. God's love is not earned. God's love is given as a gift. And and what's really interesting about God's love is you can't earn it, but also you can't devalue it by stuff you do to it. Okay, let let me try to illustrate it. Let me, all right. This is a 20, okay? All right, anybody anybody want this 20? Okay. (laughs) I see a couple of hands. Okay, now. 
just so you know, this will take you on a great date to in and out Okay, this will buy two people. I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> you can impress at in and out with this, all right? I'm just, I'm just saying, okay? So, so how many wanted this? Anybody want this? Okay, all right, all right, so, hey, hey. Okay, now, how many still want this? <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right, hold on, hold on, all right, hold on. Okay, now, how many still want this? You get it. You want this? All right, here you go. Really? All right. Now, wait, wait. No, no, you can have it. Now, now, listen. How many know that it's still worth 20? Don't ever forget, no matter how crumbled you are or how dirty you are, you can't lose your value to God. You can't. See, the dirt on the outside doesn't affect my value. Being crumbled on the inside does not affect my value. See, many of us think I'm not valuable to God because of where I've been and what I've done and what's on my life. And No. Jesus knew everything about Zacchaeus, and he still said, I must go to your house today. Now, some of you never, ever forget that the pastor gave somebody money at church, okay? Just, just, so, you, <laughs> just so you know. All right, now, now we're ready for a third, a third key, all right? Here's a third key. Zacchaeus comeback, our comeback is based on the fact that Jesus looks for outsiders, that Jesus knows and loves outsiders, and one more in your notes. Jesus' grace and truth transforms Outsiders. I want you to write the word transforms. Now watch. We read it. Let's look at it again. Luke 19, verse 6. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down, took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor Lord, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Now, let me tell you something. Zacchaeus was a transformed man. Everyone who knew the old Zacchaeus said, this is not the Zacchaeus I know. I'll give half my money to the poor. Even in the Old Testament, the tithe was 10%. I'll give 50%. In the Old Testament, if you ripped somebody off, if you cheated, if you lied, if you stole from them, you had to pay them back plus 20%. He says, if I rip somebody off Jesus, I will pay them back 400%. We're like, whoa, that is way over the top. Because this is not the same Zacchaeus. And how do we know that Zacchaeus is transformed? How do we know that salvation, how do we know that wholeness has come to his house? We know it because it showed. Watch this, verse 9. Jesus says again, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a son of Abraham. This, this message caused me to really, man, I go back to my, my Zacchaeus was a wee little man song. I go back when I was in youth group, we had a song called, If You're Saved and You Know It. Anybody ever heard that song? If you're saved and you know it, then your life will surely, yeah, you know this song. And those of you who don't, they just said show. Your life will surely show it. If you're saved, and now watch this. This passage is not telling us that he earned his salvation by giving half his money away and by paying people back four times as much. No, 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 no. See, there's an order to it. We are saved by faith, by faith, so that no one can boast because our salvation is not on what we do, it's what Jesus did. But once we accept what he did, it will change who we are in such a way Listen, if you are transformed, it will show. So the question is how, let me, let me back up. Here's my question. Have you come down from the tree? Jesus knows exactly what you're climbing, exactly where you're running to. And he comes after us and he says, come down. I find it very interesting. Until you come down, you can't be lifted up. 
until you humble yourself, you can't experience what God, humble yourself and God will lift you up. So Jesus says, come down, come down from wherever you are, come out from wherever you are. He comes down and then Jesus says, I'm inviting myself over to your house, but you have to let me in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice, any person hears my voice and will open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together. I'm not just visiting you, I'm, I'm, I'm entering into your life. So, so here's my question, have you come down from wherever you are? And have you opened the door of your heart and said, Jesus, make my heart your home? It's not enough that you show up at Bonita Valley. It's not enough that you do good things. It's not enough that you give money. It's not enough until you come down and until you open your heart and say, Jesus, come in. And my, my sincere, if you haven't done that, you can do that today before you walk out of here. And some of you say, well, I've done that. Well, here's my second question. If you've done that, in what ways does it show? The Bible often says, check up on yourself. Examine yourself. I got a couple of questions I want to walk you through. I really do. And I want you to, we're not going to pause here long, but I want you to think about a couple of questions. I'm going to put them on the screen so you can actually see them. And these are not questions for others. There's questions for you, for me. Here's one. How have my values been transformed? If I don't value things now that I didn't value before, Paul says the thing that, things in my life that I used to count so important, my, my, my pedigree, my background, my education, my position, I now count as trash. My values changed because of Jesus. Are the things you value now, you didn't used to, are the things you used to value so much and now you don't, it, it, how have your values changed? The second question, how's my vocabulary been transformed? How many of you, when, when, when you accepted Jesus, when, you, when Jesus entered your life, you had to learn some new words? How many had to unlearn some old words? How many of you, the Bible has a lot to say about our speech because the mouth reveals, what, whatever you're full of comes out of your mouth. And my mouth reveals what my heart is. And, and Paul talks about don't lie to each other. Watch what you say. Don't coarse stuff because your mouth is meant for praise and not cursing. And James says, can, can, can good water and bad water come out of the same well? So, so my vocabulary is very important. The Bible says that, that, that there's power in what you say. So how has your words changed? If they haven't changed, is it showing? The third question, how my sexual behavior has been transformed? Let's get real for a moment. We are sexual beings. God created us male and female. But God has expressions for our sexuality that will, that will make it right and great. And then there's expressions that will break us. When God says, I don't want you sleeping around. When God says, I don't want you being sexually promiscuous. When God, when God puts rules on sexuality, it's not because God is a killjoy. It's because God knows how undirected sexuality will kill us. I don't mean to be, try to be shockingly graphic. When I was a teenager growing up and sometimes the people were like going after somebody and they would talk sexually about getting a piece of somebody and the truth was that's exactly what you get, pieces. And I've seen pieces, people give pieces of themselves to so many people that they didn't feel like there was enough person to give to anybody left. See, when God says guard your sexuality, he says you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. When you invite God in, you are his home. And Paul says, would I unite my temple with a prostitute? Would I prostitute my life, my body? No way. So if my life in God isn't changing my sexuality, then I'm missing something. Or he's not really in me. How have my giving habits been transformed with my money my time, my abilities. Has anything changed in, in the way I give because Jesus is in the house? Let me, let me give you another. How has my specific ways, have my relationships been transformed? My marriage, my parenting, my friendships. How's my character been transformed? Am I more truthful? Am I, am I more timely? Am I more dependable? Character is who I am when no one's looking. How, 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 am I, how am I when I'm by myself now? Can I trust me to be with me? How's my character? How are my ambitions? I, I love this. Paul writes again in Philippians 3, and he says, how changed are my ambitions? Man, what's driving you now? Is it different than what used to drive you? 
Now, I'll be real with you. These, these aren't the easiest questions, but I want to I tell you something as, as lovingly and honestly as I can for you and for me, is that if Jesus is in the house, something changes. Not because I'm trying to put on a show, but because I have been changed. And people could look at Zacchaeus and say, that is not the same Zacchaeus. <laughs> when I was a kid, there was a question again. It was sometimes asked, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Mm. Would your friends go, no, not them. Or they go, yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot of evidence. Zacchaeus was an absolutely changed man, and it showed. In fact, Clement of Alexandria, he's a, a Christian leader of the second century, and he shares that Zacchaeus moved from Jericho to Caesarea by the sea. And I've been there. If you went to Israel with us, you've been there. Just up from Joppa. Caesarea, Caesarea by the sea. You might remember the story of Cornelius in Acts, I believe Acts chapter 10. Cornelius and the Holy Spirit visits and, and Peter goes there. That's the very place. And, and, and Clement of Alexandria, who lived in about 150 AD, writes that Zacchaeus became the pastor of the church in Caesarea by the sea. It makes sense to me because there were three regions. There was Jericho and he could get transferred to Caesarea and that he was not only a church leader, he became the pastor of that church. That's not Bible, it's church history. But what's interesting to me is he became pastor of a Gentile church. The outsider became a pastor of an outsider church because he was changed and became an agent of change. And that's what happens that's what happens when Jesus comes into our life. Because the story of Zacchaeus is more than a song of a wee little man, a wee little man was he. It's an amazing story of a comeback. The comeback of an outsider. Who was an outsider on multiple levels. Because of what he did, but because of his size and because of who he was. But he experienced, and in fact, some writers suggest the reason we have his name, because many times it just as tax collector, we have his name, was Luke, Luke wanted to know, Luke was a, an outsider himself in many ways, that Luke wanted to know his name because perhaps, again, he was a pastor of a church, and so people, oh yeah, that's the same Zacchaeus. He became an insider because Jesus looks for outsiders. He became an insider, and we become an insider because Jesus knows us and loves us. I hope you don't forget, no matter how crumbled up, no matter how dirty, no matter what's happened to the outside or inside of you, you still have value to God. And the third important truth is that Jesus transforms us. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new is coming. So here's my challenge to you once again. Do you want to come back? Do you want to come back from being on the outside to the inside? To the inside of God's will and purpose for your life? Then Zacchaeus is your man. Because his story has been recorded and preserved so that you and I might know how to come back from the outside. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? God, please help us take this word, take this story that some of us know as a child, but we need to know as an adult. We need to look at it through adult eyes. God, there's not a person in this place who hasn't felt like an outsider. And I pray by the power of your word and by your spirit that we would know how valuable we are to you. And that we would climb down from whatever tree we're whatever ladder we're on, whatever place we're pursuing, we would come down that you might come in. And right where you sit, you can pray a simple surrendering prayer, Jesus, come in. I invite you in. You're knocking at my heart, and I invite you in. You know who I am, and you still want to come in. Forgive me, cleanse me, change me. And your word says to as many as receive you, welcome you, you give them the power, the ability to become the sons and daughters of God. 